explain to me the concept of AI for someone that doesn't really have a technical background or doesn't come, you know, they're not in really in a technical field, but they're, they're hearing this word AI. Yeah, yeah. They, they might think it's Allen Iverson. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what, is, what is AI? Yeah, so um, really it's creating or giving a computer the ability to to think on its own, to make rational decisions on its own. You you see it in the form of like, I don't know if everybody's paid attention to like the, the robots that are now beating people in chess games or like mm. uh, autonomous driving, right? Things that are continuously learning without uh, human interaction. And then you kind of take a piece of AI in the form of machine learning, right? Machine learning is, is actually teaching and manually teaching um, the computers to learn, right? So let's say for instance, you want to teach your your camera to be able to detect a particular person, like uh, or a particular fruit or a water bottle, right? You will feed in all these iterations of a water bottle, all these iterations of an apple or orange or a person, right? And then now that computer can start to learn and reinforce that learning, and then ultimately get to a point where they can detect with a reasonable degree of certainty that this is in fact an apple this is in fact an orange or this is in fact the person that i think it is right and so when you start to kind of go down this path of of ai ai is the broader you know the broader umbrella of everything that falls under that and machine learning happens to fall under ai yo plug me in Welcome to another episode of the STEM Plug Podcast, episode 11. You know, we've dived into a lot of different topics here on the STEM Plug Podcast. And one of the, you know, skills that I really said that is so important or, you know, emerging trends that's out here right now is AI, right? So I thought, you know, I really had to plug in with one of my friends, Justin, Justin Ferguson, and Justin is an AI machine learning guru, and Justin is responsible for managing, you know, solution integration initiatives with product strategy. So, Justin, how's it going? Welcome to the STEM Plug Podcast. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me. It's going well. It's going well. High praise from you, so I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) No, for sure. Really wanted to really dive into... You know, artificial intelligence is so much out there in the news now, mm-hmm. different things. Yeah. But I really wanted to get you on, you know, as a, as a subject matter expert where we can really go ahead and plug into the field. Right. For sure. So I really think it's dope that you're in AI and machine mm-hmm. learning, but you didn't really start off that way. Right. right. You didn't yep. go to school that. So let's kind of start off with your journey. Right. Yeah. What engineering did you study? In Industrial school engineering okay. yep, at NC State. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, I started it with industrial engineering at NC State, and I really kind of approached engineering, I think, a little bit more unconventional than most students. So, like, I knew that I wanted to be an engineer, but I also knew that I really liked business, and I felt like industrial engineering was kind of the mix between the two. And so um, as I kind of went through my, my program at NC State, I got out of school, and like most people, I had no idea what I wanted to do. So my first job was actually uh, a mix of those two engineering and and business in the form of sales engineer, um, which was a very cool, uh, very cool career path. Um, I thought there was I wanted to make the most money up front. Right. As you can kind of imagine by me trying to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do, I was really trying to, you know, seek guidance from as many people as possible. And so I found a couple of mentors at Snyder. Um, that, you know, helped me to kind of build out my own individual development plan. And so one of the the pieces of feedback that I got was really to gain a skill from every role that you have. And by the time you finish gathering all these skills, you should have an idea of where you want to go. And so from sales, I took, you know, being an effective communicator, um, being able to get what you want, being able to uh, build relationships with people, And then I navigate it to the other side of the business, which is project management, which, you know, I think you're very familiar with project management. So did that for a little bit. Um, Then I decided to kind of take a shift and go more the design route in the form of uh, a solution architect. And then lastly, you know, while I was at that point, I really wanted to kind of get back into the space of, 
kind of that industrial engineer stats background. And so I went back to get my master's from Wake and then transitioned over to SAS. Okay. So so with all that being said, did you take any like certifications specifically mm -hmm. to get into AI or did you just rely on your kind of your practical experience and translate yeah. it into that to that area? For me, I did go back and get my master's at Wake Forest in uh, business analytics. Okay. And so I wanted to, I didn't want to step fully away from corporate America um, because I very enjoy, much enjoyed the paycheck, right? <laughs> but, talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's plug in. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I, I didn't want to step away from the from the paycheck, so I did the online course, and I was part of the first cohort. And I remember my pr first professor that I had, um, Dr. Balin, and then also Mike Ames, they both worked at SAS. And so they had transitioned at the time from working at SAS, but they taught us programming in, in R. They taught us programming in SAS. And so that was kind of really my first introduction to kind of the world of data science and, and AI and machine learning. And so that's kind of what sparked everything and, and put me on my trajectory to where I am now. Mm, yeah. Okay, okay. So with that being said, right, so what, what kind of motivated your, you know, your transition from mm -hmm. your previous area that you're in yeah. to kind of being in AI now? Was it, was it, uh, you know, we could talk about it. Was it, yeah. the, was it the bag? Was it the money? <laughs> what, 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 what kind of uh, motivated yeah, yeah. that transition? A little bit of everything. Um, I think the money definitely played a part, for sure, <laughs> for sure. I don't want to minimize that. But I think another thing that played a part was really transitioning into a space that was still relatively new and being kind of on the front end of it right um i didn't want to kind of stay in this space that was you know a little bit uncertain or rely too heavily on regulation or you know was in kind of this one little niche space i wanted to go somewhere that kind of gave me the freedom to kind of go along with the trend instead of kind of being on the back end of it so the money played a part but not being in an industry that wasn't, you know, faltering or anything like that really was important to me as well. Mm, mm, okay. So would you say, I know we, we talked about like, you know, the, the educational part, right? Yeah. Um, would you say there were any other kind of necessary steps that you had to take to kind of get yourself into the path of being within AI? Absolutely. Um, I think first I had to figure out what, what space within AI, because AI is big, it's huge, right? So like, do you want to be the data scientist? Do you want to be the business analyst, right? Do you want to be the machine learning engineer or the product manager, right? And so really kind of figuring out what space you want to fall into or what space you want to kind of go down that, that path to um, really kind of helped me. And so I knew I didn't want to code like every day. I just <laughs> knew that for a fact. And so product management was kind of the thing that, that really – uh, spoke to me the most because it gave me the ability to both use all the skills that I had gained from past roles, like communicating effectively, leading a team, managing a project, right? But it also gave me the fulfillment of starting from something that was just an idea to getting to something that is actually a tangible feature or or a product that a user, not you know, that has no idea that I worked on this product, can actually use and give you know good feedback on. So that was kind of that fulfillment piece, a part of that uh, that transition. Mm. Wow, nah, yeah. that's that's. Uh, I'm glad you shared that, right? Because yeah. you know, a lot of times we see AI and we we think that you know maybe the only part that you can mm -hmm. go into is mm -hmm. coding. Yeah. But you gave the background of you know you had that that technical background, but now you're just kind of a, a leader yeah. in the field and and kind of helping helping build. Yeah. So um, are there any like resources or, or learning that you would recommend for someone that maybe wants to get within AI? Absolutely. So I think, again, it depends on what you're trying to do. But if you just kind of want a broad overview of what the space looks like, a lot of the big companies like Microsoft or AWS, for example, they have these certifications that give you two, you know, two values for the purchase of, of one. Right. And, and I say purchase loosely because a lot of this stuff is free. Um, you could go on the Azure website and take a data fundamentals uh, certification or you can take an AI fundamental certification. And for the most part, it's free. You just have to pay for the exam, which is, I mean, it's not, I don't think it's that much. I think it's maybe like $95 to take the exam. Mm. Um, but you can take as much time as you want to kind of study for that. And so that's one thing that I would say or that I would recommend someone that's looking to jump into the space. Go look for some certifications. You don't have to go down to Python boot camp or anything like that. But again, it depends on what you're trying to do. Mm -hmm. If you want to be a data scientist, then the boot camp might be the best way. But if you just want to kind of have a general understanding of the space, 
and then kind of pick the path you want to go down, then I would start with a certification like the Azure certification. Okay. Yeah. Or you can just plug in with Justin. Yeah. Or you can just, or you can hit me up. We can talk. <laughs> yeah. Nah, nah. You, 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 you dropping some gems, right? So um, I guess my question is like, we hear AI, right? Yeah. People, people might like, like, oh, AI is taking over. It's doing yeah. all this different stuff, right? Yeah. So that's kind of explain in simpler terms, right? Yeah. Explain to me the concept of AI for someone that doesn't really have a technical background or doesn't come, you know, they're not in really in a technical field, but they're they're hearing this word AI. Yeah, yeah. They, they might think it's Allen Iverson. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what, is, what is AI? Yeah, so um, really it's creating or giving a computer the ability to to think on its own, to make rational decisions on its own. You you see it in the form of like, I don't know if everybody's paid attention to like the the robots that are now beating people in chess games or like mm. uh, autonomous driving, right? Things that are continuously learning without uh, human interaction. And then you kind of take a piece of AI in the form of machine learning, right? Machine learning is, is actually teaching and manually teaching um, the computers to learn, right? So let's say for instance, you want to teach your your camera to be able to detect a particular person, like uh, or a particular fruit or a water bottle, right? You will feed in all these iterations of a water bottle, all these iterations of an apple or orange or a person, right? And then now that computer can start to learn and reinforce that learning, and then ultimately get to a point where they can detect with a reasonable degree of certainty that this is in fact an apple this is in fact an orange or this is in fact the person that i think it is right and so when you start to kind of go down this path of of ai ai is the broader you know the broader umbrella of everything that falls under that and machine learning happens to fall under ai mm. yeah. okay okay so that, that brings up a great point so machine learning right yep so in broader terms i guess how would you really define that within AI, though? I know machine learning mm -hmm. is a bit different in AI, mm -hmm. but they kind of work together in the same yeah. point, right? Yep. So machine learning, I'm hearing the machine, right? How, how is mm -hmm. that machine learning? <laughs> <laughs> so so it, depends, it depends on the algorithm, right? I think we'll use computer vision for an example. Mm -hmm. Again, so like if you want to teach your camera, let's say you're, you're at home, you create this security system, and you want to be able to detect your family members, right, that come to your house mm. so that you can look and see whether or not somebody that's, you know, uh, a stranger or maybe somebody looking to break in your house uh, comes to your house. You want to be able to detect that. You can actually program your, your camera to see your daughter, your father, your son, your wife, who have, whoever, your husband, whoever, to detect those particular people. And it can actually label those people as well. And, and it'll label it wife or whatever that wife's name is, for example. Or you can detect it to kind of look for specific cars, all right? You know that this car specifically has been, you know, maybe it has been hanging out for too long in this particular area. Maybe you can train your, your camera to look for that particular car. That's something that you can do as well. But the, the way that you're training this, this model, right, you're feeding it pictures. You're feeding mm -hmm. it images of these people, of these items, of these, this car, right? And that's how that computer is learning. And so when it sees, let's say you're only feeding them a red car, photos right when it sees a black car it likely fail because it's never actually seen a black car before mm. and so you have to continuously add in all these iterations so that it can reasonably make an accurate decision um when it's processing through those various images okay okay nah that's that's dope man yeah. it's like it's crazy how you you think about like you know specifically me i work in um i work in automation mm -hmm. and i've been in uh working in automation as a uh, engineer now for about four or five years yeah. and um, just crazy about how much you know growth that I've seen mm -hmm. over the over the past five years and I can only imagine yeah. um, you know what's going to kind of come about yeah. uh, in the in the future right mm -hmm. so I guess the question that I have is like what is one of the kind of main challenges that you're seeing right now with mm -hmm. maybe AI and ML just kind of like sol solving complex issues is there any Things of you seeing that can uh, need some growth. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot actually. So <laughs> there's this whole <laughs> there's this whole notion of regulation. Number one, I think that that needs improvement, right? Like, but 
I want to preface and say that I don't think we should speed to regulation, right? I think it should be a situation where we have our leaders, and to a certain extent we do. We have leaders from the big companies like Microsoft and, and, and IBM, SAS, et cetera, right? And then you have those people bringing their industry expertise into the regulators, and now they can make a joint decision on what's best for the particular you know, space. So regulation, I think, is one. Um, bias, just in models and data as a whole, I think that's another area that really needs a lot of growth. Um, when you think about, you know, getting approved for a business loan or going through the underwriting process or something like that, you have a risk profile. And so if, you know, an insurer or an underwriter decides that you are a risky person because you live in this particular zip code, because you have this particular, you know, family um, demographics or you have this particular skin tone or you're a male or a female, right? You can then see how the bias starts to creep into the models that are ultimately making the decision on whether or not you're actually going to get this business loan or whether or not you're going to get this this insurance or, or what have you. So I think those are probably the top two things that I would say. Um, I don't really see too many issues with like accuracy of models mm -hmm. just because, I mean, you can put a neural network on something and it can pretty much give you a very accurate answer, but it's not explainable, right? You don't really know what the, what it did to get you that answer. So mm -hmm. as you can imagine, that starts to bring in a lot of issues as well, because when you're in regulated areas like healthcare or like finance, right, they need to know how you made that decision. Mm -hmm. Those are the things that I think are top of mind for me, what needs improvement. Mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. So I guess looking at it from a team standpoint, with your team, yeah. right? How do you kind of ensure like you know ethical considerations are being taken in yeah. place when you're like kind of developing these AI and ML systems? So I think it's good to have a diverse team. You have, I mean, of course I'm African American, right? <laughs> but you know, have women. You have other um, ethnic groups as well. I think that's very important. I think it's also important to have kind of. Um, this notion of keeping humans at the center of those decisions that are being made. Because if you just allow users to just rely on models without any human interaction, for the most part, it likely won't turn out very well for the humans, right? And so I'm not trying to be um, you know, negative or anything like that, but that's just mm -hmm. kind of the logic behind everything. And so those that's kind of the the external factors that come into play. From a modeling perspective or from a data perspective, there are algorithms and, and metrics that can be used to make your models more explainable, to highlight variables that are inherently sensitive or inherently biased or private in nature. There are also metrics that you can use to kind of make things more favorable, let's say, I'll put favorable in quotes, or more equitable um, for various groups of people that, that may come up in a particular model or may come up in data. So. All of those things together kind of make, I would say, the ideal place for an equitable and, and responsible decision. But all of that's also a process, right? Everything can involve everything, you know what I mean? So you yeah. have to kind of make sure that the application fits what you're trying to add to the recipe. No, nah, that's you, you brought up a great point that I always kind of think about, right? Mm -hmm. It's just like, how do we kind of navigate, you know, the balance of AI and human Decision making, right? Yeah. Especially when critical domains. Like, how yeah. do you, how do you uh, how do you navigate that balance of knowing, like, all right, yeah. no, this still needs to be <laughs> human regulated and yeah. not, you know, just kind of letting AI take over. How, how yeah. do you how do we balance that? I think the easy rule of thumb is um, if the decision will uh, impact people's lives, I think that's kind of a good rule of thumb to start with. Now, there are some industries that don't directly align with let's say, a highly regulated industries, but kind of indirectly aligned with like Internet of Things, right? Mm. So while it doesn't technically fall into like a regulated industry like healthcare, humans interact with the data that they get from sensors that you get on your phone, that, you know, that you get from just the Wi-Fi, right? Mm -hmm. And so who's responsible, right? Who Who's the person that you go to to say, all right, I got this thing, I got some data authentication issues on my phone, right? Is it Verizon's fault because of the network? Is it Apple's fault because they built the phone? Or is mm -hmm. it Spectrum or any other Wi-Fi provider because they're, you know, I'm on Wi-Fi right now? So I think there's a lot of ambiguity in those spaces. And so, again, 
it's another reason why I would say regulation is going to have to be a big play for for us to make sure that we have the guidelines for the specific industries. I think we, we are moving in the right place or moving in the right direction at least. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Are there any like advancements or trends um, in AI that you kind of anticipate in the near future? Yeah. So I think some of the trends, and I, and I say trends lightly because, again, I hate to, I hate to use this phrase but it depends right <laughs> so like a lot of things are already been done or have been done right mm -hmm. so like think about the the COVID mrna right that stuff has been around for a very long time it's just COVID kind of brought it out and so you have things like that in the form of like digital twins or in the form of synthetic data that have that people have been doing for a little bit it just hasn't been operationalized or generalized for the vast majority of people and so people are now starting to understand the benefit of being able to generate data where maybe I'm working with a hospital, they don't want to give me patient names. I maybe want to still see what might happen. So maybe I want to generate some synthetic data so that I don't, you know, compromise anybody's personal data, right? You can see a benefit in that in the healthcare space. Let's say digital twins, for example, maybe I want to see what all of these various scenarios are going to be for this turbine, for this airplane. If I do this, how is this going to interact with that? If I do this, how is that going to interact with this? So like those are two examples of, of spaces that I think we'll see a lot of growth from um, in the near future. But again, I, I think it all depends on kind of where where people go with it, how many people adopt it and how interested people are in it and how comfortable they are, they are with it. One of the things that I really find interesting with AI is, you know, I, I use a lot of, uh, I use AI to help me create different content, yep, different yep. stuff like that. And, um, you know, chat GBT, yep. everybody <laughs> is taking over right now. A yep. lot of people are using uh, chat GBT for different features, right? Yeah. Um, but I definitely feel like sometimes, you know, people may overuse it. For sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> for sure. like, where, where do you kind of see the impact or foresee the impact of AI having on, on education in the future? Do you... Yeah. Where do you where do you kind of see that going? So I think chat GTP for just as an example, yeah. I think that's going to have the impact that the younger generation kind of allows it to have. So like I know a lot of students now are using it to write essays and they're getting <laughs> caught or like I know they're using it to, you know, do other things like help them with homework assignments, tests, quizzes, whatever. Right. And they get caught. Right. Um, so I think that piece is you know it's the bad side of it i think it is powerful a powerful tool i think people should use it but i think people should use it as a complementary tool you know what i mean um something that they can use in uh, conjunction with what they already know or what they're already doing so like for instance if you're having writer's block mm. ask give it a prompt see what it spits out take what it's you know take what it spits out and then kind of start to form your own stuff from it right or like for instance if you're struggling with code it doesn't make sense for you to sit there and look at your computer for the next six hours if you can ask chat gtp hey can you help me with this r code or this python code um, for this you don't have to give it specific variables that might be proprietary for a user or project or whatever you're working on but you can give it example variables and say hey build me a query for this, build me a algorithm for this, and it'll spit it out. And that's how you, I think that's the best way to use chat GTP. Um, mm. So, yeah. No, nah, no, nah, that's that's dope. Like you said, kind of just really having that, I guess, foundational knowledge, right? And then yeah. you want to kind of build upon that. Don't try yeah. to have AI do everything right. for nah, you, right? Nah, like nah, nah, like nah. you got to get AI <laughs> a little break, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. But that, that's dope. So. I guess with you, right, within your um, your AI journey, are mm -hmm. there any um, specific projects? That you, without you, you know, fully disclosing yeah, yeah, everything, yeah, yeah. are there yeah. any projects that you're kind of excited about or that you've, you know, worked on in your journey that have been pretty pretty cool within AI? <sighs> within AI, yes. Um, most of them have been while I was in school, and that's not talking about work or anything like that. Most <laughs> of them have been um, while I was in school. We did a couple of projects um, around, like for instance, the opioid epidemic. So we actually ran a model or built models to see uh, which doctors were over prescribing opioids. Mm -hmm. And so we built in a specific threshold and 
it was actually real data. So it had like people's addresses and stuff. It was it was crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was one project. Um, I, I found a project on Kaggle as well, which is kind of this this website that allows you users to come in and do projects for various companies. And so they'll release like a data set and they'll have like a problem statement and you'll go and you'll build your model and whoever has the best um, accuracy metric, um, I'll generalize the accuracy metric, will um, in most cases win like a cash prize associated with it. So I did one of those as part of my um, senior project. And so mine was really around highlighting why um, women, people of color weren't applying for a lot of jobs um, and I can't, I think it was somewhere in California. Um, but a lot of it was around how words or how the job descriptions were written, right? So they use words like he, or they use words, um, that were inherently more quote unquote masculine or, or inherently more quote unquote feminine. Right. So mm -hmm. you can kind of see how, if I read, if I am a, you know, a man and I read something that has quote unquote feminine language and I'll put that in quotes, I might be less inclined to apply for that role because I don't think that that role is for me. Mm. And so I think that's more impactful for, you know, women, of course. And I think it's more impactful for people of color because I think we a lot of times struggle with this notion of feeling like we have the qualifications to be where we need to be or we get in imposter syndrome when we get there and, and feel like, you know, we're not good enough and, and things like that. So I know it's small, but the whole text analytics project that I did was really like, an eye opener for me because it was kind of like the realization that something that I think our group of people have been thinking about for a while can show up in even the smallest minute details, like a job description, for example. It might keep you from applying from a job just because it says, you know, it has X amount of salary or X amount of education requirements or X years of service. I don't know about you, but like if I see that, I see it, it requires six years of ex of experience and I don't have six years, I would be a little hesitant to apply for it. You know what I mean? <laughs> if I see it says 12 and I don't have 12, I'd be a little bit more hesitant to apply. So yeah. it was things like that that I worked on that were pretty cool. Okay. Wow. I know before we started diving into the podcast, mm -hmm. we were talking about like, you know, different conferences and different stuff surrounding, yeah. um, surrounding AI. So what advice would you kind of give to an individual or even an organization that really needs to wants to stay on up with the latest trends in AI, right? They yeah. see where the, the world is going and see how important mm -hmm. it is. How can an individual, you know, really stay up to the, up to tell with the latest trends? Yeah, the thing that works for me is, I think, finding specific influencers on Twitter specifically. I find that the influence on, on Twitter are a little bit, I'll say better. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll say that in, in yeah. quotes. And I, the reason why I say that is because I think it's very hard for people, especially, you know, after being in, in the house for a couple of years, for people to really have intelligent conversation and you to kind of sift through a lot of the fluff that comes in those conversations. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you have a certain amount of characters to get a thought across, an intelligent thought across, mm -hmm. I feel like most people can't do that. And I feel like there's a certain there's a certain group of people. Now, I'm not saying that everybody's on Twitter as an expert, but I think there's a certain group of people that can communicate these ideas in a thoughtful and very effective way that are worth listening to. Um, and Andrew Nigg is one of those uh, people. I think he started Khan University, maybe, or Khan Academy. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's one of those those people that I think communicates very effectively. And if he's not specifically communicating, he can actually, he'll retweet things that, you know, you might find interesting. And so you can look at stuff like that. You can look at uh, organizations like NIST that are putting together guidelines around AI. Mm -hmm. um, the EU Act is, has um, or some recent regulation out in the EU. Singapore is doing some good work around kind of frameworks and guidelines that you can use. Um, and a lot of these larger corporations are also forming their own responsible AI or trustworthy AI organizations as well. So people from those groups, um, not like, again, I'm not saying everybody, but <laughs> you kind of have to use your best judgment on the people that you want to listen to, just like any other thing. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a good place to start if you're looking for actual people to kind of add a little value to or add a little sauce to what you already know or might not know about AI. 
Okay. Yeah. So, so do you have any, I guess, specific advice? You know, stem plug podcast. Yeah. We we cater we cater to all people, right? Okay. So it might be someone that doesn't have a technical background, yeah. right? Yeah. But they're seeing AI. They're like, oh, AI isn't yeah. Allen Iverson. This is actually something that I can do, right? Yeah, <laughs> it is. So what <laughs> what what advice would you give to mm-hmm. someone that doesn't really have a non mm-hmm. uh they they have a non technical background, right? Yeah. But they want to enter in the field of AI. Do you feel as though there's opportunities that People can get into AI without even having a, you know, specifically a four-year degree? Yes. Uh, and the reason why I say that is because um, I think, number one, a lot of startups need need help as well. I think it'll be a little bit tougher for the more traditional companies because they have expectations. But even some of those companies, they're starting to lift a lot of the college regulations. But I think if you don't have any technical background, if you don't have any experience, Everybody has a passion, right? Whether it's music or it could be arts, it could be finance, right? Find one of those projects and see how you can apply AI to it, right? And it could be something simple as figuring out how to, um, you know, create. You've seen these AI music uh, (laughs) videos that have been coming out. Mm. It could be something as simple as, you know, making an AI song or that to sing, I don't know, Mary Had a Little ha- Lamb or something like that, right? Just something small in your passion area that you can focus on, you can spend time on because that's going to be the key, spending time on it. And I think it's a lot harder for people to spend time on things they're not really passionate about, especially when you're trying to get started and learn something new. So, like, just spend some time, pick a project that you want to do. One of the first projects I did was building a algorithm to um, – to kind of highlight the differences between one portfolio that might be that might was was a little bit uh, more conservative uh, to a portfolio that was a little bit more aggressive, and just comparing the two, that was mm-hmm. a project. And I know that sounds that probably sounds like more complicated than what you know it actually is. But like when you actually start looking through information online and you actually start finding like snippets of code, you realize it's not as robust and it's not as complex as you think it is. Mm-hmm. No, that's 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 dope. We plugged into a lot of areas mm-hmm. of AI and machine learning, right? Yeah. And you've you've had a you've had an amazing journey, right? Yeah. yeah. But I really want to kind of learn from you, right? Mm-hmm. Has there been any kind of obstacles or or challenges that you've kind of faced yeah. on this amazing uh, journey up to the AI path? You know, have <laughs> what? Let's plug us in with you know kind of some of the challenges that you might have went through. So. Someone can really learn from your story, right? Yeah, yeah. Are you speaking AI specifically, or are you just speaking in general? Whatever you want to plug <laughs> okay. in, bro. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you want to plug in. <laughs> yeah. So I think, um, I think for me, there was a a bit of imposter syndrome that kind of snuck in, and the reason why I say that is because I've had the the privilege to kind of jump into a lot of different fields. I started in energy management. I moved into uh, supply chain uh, software. Then I moved into kind of this billing subscription-based stuff, and now I'm in AI machine learning. And so with that, I never really was able to really spend as much time learning in these areas. I just kind of had to go in and just show up day one, right? And so as you can imagine, I'm around these smart people all the time. And so I had to spend a lot of time, like, you know, after hours, staying up, reading, and, and actually looking through videos and finding cool stuff online just so that I felt like I was in the same stratosphere, you know what I mean, as as the people that have been doing this for 20 years. Um, and so I think that, for me, kind of contributed to a lot of the imposter syndrome that kind of came up. I think I was a little bit too harsh on myself. And the reason why I say that is because there's so much value you can add to a room full of PhDs. There's so much value you can add to a room full of experts. There's so much value you can add to a room full of people that, you know, are, have been doing this for 20, 30, 40 years. And so once I realized what my value was, and that value was really connecting people, even if I didn't know the answer, I knew how to find somebody that did know the answer. And so that was the value that I started bringing to the table. And so people started to respect that, and I started to get more opportunities. And then through that process, I was also learning about the things that I had originally had no idea about. And so it was kind of this double win for me because I'm both adding value and I'm learning at the same time. So I was able to grow both professionally and personally, honestly. Yeah. 
Nah, that's, I mean, I, I can kind of attest to that too on my journey, you know. Imposter syndrome is real, right? Yeah, 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 for you sure. You know, especially when you're the youngest person on your team. Mm -hmm. Everybody doesn't look like you. It's yep. like, you know, those yeah. thoughts come through your head. So I yeah. definitely can agree with you on that. And um, But now, look at you now through your experience. You uh, kind of got through all of that, right? Yeah. So would you say there's a specific uh, soft skill that is, is well, you know, really good for being within the field of AI? Is it yeah. a key soft skill that you would kind of tone on? Yeah, for sure. I think um, being able to communicate complicated ideas and complicated um, topics effectively to all people, right? Not just the most technical person in the room. And I, there are some people that just kind of want to use a lot of big words and just kind of <laughs> sound smart, you know what I mean? But yeah. I, what I found is that there are more people that have no idea what you're talking about than there are that do. And so being able to just take a complicated topic and communicate it to somebody that has no idea what you're talking about and they actually understand it, I think that's the best skill that you can have in analytics because you can really, honestly, anybody can learn how to code. And I'm not saying everybody can code at a high level, but everybody can learn how to code. And so when you can kind of take the results that you've got from whatever your pet project is or your project at work and kind of synthesize that into something that um, is relatable or something can something that people can understand effectively I think that's kind of the thing that takes you to the next level that I think most people overlook mm, mm, okay okay well now I appreciate you plugging in everything sure. we plugged in today Justin how can our um, you know our listen listeners and audience stay in contact with you yeah, yeah, yeah for social media for sure for sure so um i was just telling you offline <laughs> um i'm not too big on social media but feel free to connect with me on linkedin justin ferguson and if you do want to follow me on twitter i just created a twitter today so give me some grace there okay, we'll get those um, followers. but it's it's j ferguson x10 so j ferguson times 10 so uh, that's my Twitter handle. And, uh, yeah, man, I appreciate you having me on here. Okay. Yeah. Well, we appreciate you plugging in with us today, Justin, on the STEM Plug Podcast, episode 11. Uh, you plugged in a lot of areas of AI and machine learning. Um, so make sure you subscribe and hit that like button. And stay tuned for more from Justin in the future. Stay plugged in.